Hello, everyone. Welcome to Truth Talks with Dr. Anne. So today we are continuing our series with Chanel Fall. And Chanel is going to be talking to us today about the issue that really started the ball rolling for her and got her suspended from teaching. Um, and that's critical race theory. So welcome, Chanel. Thank you for coming back and uh, talking about this because we are talking about really everything that's happening educationally within the public school system. And critical race theory is definitely one of those uh, hot buttons educationally that's on steroids for our kids. So let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. So this first slide that we see here, is it uh, visible? Yeah, okay. Um, I posted this not too long ago. It's just about students who are drawing their identity. They're they're drawing self portraits using markers of all the skin tone colors and all that. And it says we are connecting this to larger concepts of identity, oppression, allyship, equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti oppression. So I posted this recently, and as as well, the replies came in. There were a lot who said. How could you ever oppose this? Why would you ever um, oppose teaching about oppression and inclusion and all this stuff? It sounds so good. Yeah, I agree. It does sound good. But the reality is, as with the gender stuff that we talked about before, um, what we're doing is we're making students be hyper aware of these traits that group them by into tribes, kind of. And yes. Yeah, and, and it puts them against their peers. Um, it confuses them about, well, really the values of our society, which we're supposed to be colorblindness, where we don't treat people differently based on their race. And it's not a big deal uh, what color you are. That really doesn't matter because what matters is your character. This is how it was before. And it's so sad that now you can see this is in grade seven, six, seven, eight. Yes, um, but it starts younger than that. Kids are, I've seen pictures of kindergartners um, comparing their skin colors and trying to find the right shade for their skin color. And you might say, well, why not? If they're going to draw, draw themselves, they have to, they, they might want to get the right skin tone. Okay, that's fine. But maybe it looks sort of innocent, but the reality is in that classroom, they're having discussions that you're not privy to. And those probably include discussions on power and privilege and things like this maybe in kindergarten they won't go into much detail but the kids are not stupid and they can sense when um you know this this subject is a big deal and uh, it's it's important well to classify everyone by race it obviously is a big deal because look at all the hashtags yeah. instead of being a simple okay let's let's um talk about the beauty of skin color which that sounds pretty good. I like my skin color. If I was black, I'd be happy to. I mean, <laughs> I, but okay, the beauty of skin color. And then it's aspects of their visible identity. So, you know, then you immediately start subcategories and then you get to the hashtags and you go, okay, what is it really about? It's not just a simple ac exercise of, of coloring a picture. Is so much more than that. So let's go to the next one because this is another one. Mm -hmm. um, quite a challenge, this one. Yeah, this is awesome. Cool. I can't remember the name of the book, but it's, um, I think it's just one of the pages in the book where it compares whiteness to basically a deal with the devil. And wow. We can see the whole. Uh, picture you'll see it's there, I think there's if I remember correctly there's a devil and they're shaking hands kind of like a deal where um, if you're white you get well it says at the top you get stolen land stolen riches and special favors um, so no wonder kids are running away from it if they could identify as black well apparently some can now as you said last week some teacher was doing that but most kids aren't going to do that. They, they, they can't identify as some other race. And what they're going to do instead is run from their gender because all they're trying to do mm. is run from this nasty label of privilege and um, 
power that was imposed on them. Well, this is, when I read this, whiteness gets to mess endlessly with the lives of your friends. This is so uh, demoralizing to children. It's so demoralizing to me. Like, because I'm white, I mess with my friends and loved ones uh, for the purpose of profit. It's, it's just, how does, how do educators validate mm -hmm. this kind of teaching? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have no idea. I don't know how any sane uh, human being, especially someone who was in teaching 20 years ago and knew what it was like when things were fairly normal, and now they've accepted this, I really can't understand. The new teachers who have never known anything different, I mean, maybe fine if you learn this in teacher's college and you think that this is the way to go. Yeah. But even then, um, when you're telling children that whiteness is bad, and this is how they explain it, right? They say, well, whiteness isn't, isn't about your skin color, though. We're talking about an ideology. So, so we're allowed. It's like we're allowed to... Well, we don't do the same thing with blackness. Imagine saying, oh, blackness is um, this terrible thing. People would freak out. Yeah, and that you're, you're you know, endlessly uh, punishing your your friends or your loved ones just because you're black just and you're doing it for a profit. Like if you turned it upside down, that's exactly what it would say. And, and this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean... How do children pull all this apart? Like it's it's just to me, well, radical, radical indoctrination. What about um, when we look at this next one, FLS leadership team? Uh, what do you say, FLS? French is a second language. Ah, okay, 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 awesome. <laughs> There's two. Yes, so so English as a second language and French as a second language. There was another one I posted. Uh, this summer, that was an ESL PD day. So teachers are learning to help newcomer students who, who don't work proficient in English. And it was all just about um, whiteness, white privilege, uh, interest wow. in quality. So the, the teachers did not discuss English basically at all like maybe 10% of the day was actually talking about English language. So that is something I actually have heard about. And you think, okay, so most of these um, individuals who are learning, you know, English, a lot of them, I won't say most, but a lot of them are recent immigrants as well. And a lot of recent immigrants do not cave to this kind of, um, ideology. They, they're they just astounded. They came to Canada and they come to, um, you know, an English class to learn English. And then they're, they're being subjected to this, this kind of, um, foreign behavior. <laughs> you know, they just, they often are vehemently opposed to it. And yet they're stuck in it, just like the children in our schools. Wow. Well, this is wow. being pushed on kids, so I guess they just take advantage of that. If the parents would not align with these values, I'm sure they came here for a better life, of mm -hmm. everything. Um, but the kids, they don't know any better. So I, I don't know exactly how much of this is being pushed on kids, but I think the whole premise here, why this gets tied into language, is because um, they, f they figure, okay, one of the most important skills is kids need to learn to read and write, right? Technically. Yes. So how do we get to that goal? And then the, the theory is, well, the kids have to see themselves in the learning. So they have to feel affirmed in their identity. So we have all of these beliefs about groups and, and their uh, relative oppression. And we, we think, okay, well, the, the brown kids, they're not going to learn to read unless unless we read them books about brown kids. And so we have to talk about privilege and oppression and blah, 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 if we want them to succeed academically. Now, the thing is, we never get to the actual goal because we just get tied into all these politics, like this, this political stuff. It's, um, 
like Paulo Freire uh, or whatever. Um, it's it's his handbook. He he was a Marxist, and this is what he did. Literacy was inherently political. It wasn't about teaching kids to write and and to read. It was to teach kids to view the world through a certain lens, uh, yes. where groups are divided into. Or, or people are divided into multiple groups. Some of them are oppressed. Some of them aren't. And yeah, this is this. I mean, actually, there was something I posted just a few days ago. It was at the. Oh, I'm going to get the board wrong, so I'm not going to say it. But it was so blatant. Oh, it was the Toronto District School Board. It was so. Blatant. Oh well, there you go. <laughs> it actually said in it that literacy is not just about learning to read and write but learning about equity and diversity or something like that and there was many different um like elements in this list it was describing what literacy is and it was all about how literacy is actually political indoctrination and this was taught to educators at a at a high school in toronto well well, I think I'm right that uh, we cannot change this uh, education system from the inside out. It has to collapse because this is it, this is just so prevalent in every aspect of education from, uh, as we saw last uh, last week, from kindergarten all the way through university. And I'm that's why I'm so glad to be involved in a group that is uh, seeking to provide classical education from kindergarten to the end of university because we get them through even if we get them through somewhat unscathed that means you take their cell phones until they're old enough to understand uh how to use them and you have had parental input into their lives and they've had a good education then they go to university two weeks in a university and my goodness these uh, young adults are just swarmed and swamped with all of this, you know, diversity, um, equity and inclusion. And it's just, there's no way around it. So we have to change the whole system. So how, well, talking about that, go ahead. How would you go about doing that? Like, are you pushing for uh, charter schools or like, yeah. do you? We've, um, I did actually um, this week, my interview with Bruce Friesen, uh, went up. It just came out yesterday, and so we talk about a lot about that and uh, what's happening in other countries, uh, what other countries are doing, and the new schools um, that are happening. Many of them are actually uh, coordinating with churches, because and it's not about teaching a religion. It's about providing uh, access and providing the venue in order to teach a classical education formed uh, on a foundation of moral substance, a Judeo-Christian perspective. But even then, um, yeah, anyways, but Fine. that was last week. So, and uh, he'll be on again next week. So your show is going to be after his. <laughs> but oh, yeah, it's very Fine. helpful to understand. Because the parents, like so many parents I know, don't want their kids in the public school system, but they also are out of options because they work. So they can't yes. school their kid and they have, like, we need an option for those parents who don't want their kids brainwashed, but also can't homeschool. And That's charter right. schools to me seems to be the answer, but they're not, we don't have that option here in Ontario. I think the only province that has that option is Alberta. Alberta has good charter schools, but you know what? We still have option to start private schools and and that we will push more and more for and so i think what and so we get into that bruce and i talk about that also scott maston um i don't know if you know scott or not but um he he's uh, also involved in this group anyways i don't want to get sidelined onto that because i want to stay kind of with what your focus has been um on exposing what's going on in the public schools um, but I will say this before we go on, that I read recently that in the last year in Ontario, 52%, there's a 52% increase in uh, enrollment in uh, private education. 
So that's incredible. That's a momentum we have to keep moving toward. And Bruce ha has ideas and we're working with others um, who will fund, um, provide funds for parents who can't afford uh, these options. So, I mean, this is long term. It's not happening tomorrow, but um, there is some hope on the horizon. Okay, so let's go back to critical race and let's look at the next slide. The Office of Human Rights and Equity Advisor. Tell me about her. Yeah, well, I don't know too much about this Layla Saad person, but there are so many of these people just getting money off racial division, uh, causing racial division. But um, so this, if I remember correctly, it was with the York Catholic District School Board. And oh. what they did was they sent out an email to all admins. You can see there it says, if you have been a newly commissioned principal or vice principal in, uh, in August 2022 or August 2023, and you have not yet received a copy of the two resources, so it's this me and white supremacy book, and then there's a guided journal with it. You are asked to email them so that they can get it to you. And basically this, the idea is that they're going to do like a group study or whatever. They're going to be reading it together and obviously talking about it and all this. So you cannot be a principal or a vice principal at the York Catholic District School Board if uh, you're not willing to go along with it. And this is a Catholic school system. I mean, and I know a lot of Catholics who are really disturbed about the stuff that's being taught in the Catholic schools. I mean, gender identity and critical race theory. I mean, it's no different really than many public schools. So that's, uh, so I'm reading this. And so this is sort of like her personal story. I think that my book on Damaged by the Predators Among Us would be a great personal story for every single teacher to read. I think that would be a good one. Um, let's talk about some real truth about mm, some pedophiles in the uh, in our society that are right front and center. Anyways, I digress. Okay, let's go to the next one. So this is grade eight. Oh yeah, that was a recent one. This is, so <laughs> what I wrote was, I think the uh, race grifters are tired of only having February to talk about Black History Month and all that to push. And obviously we're not talking just about history, Black history. Okay? We're talking about politics and um, what it means to be Black and uh, with a very biased lens. So they've decided now that in order to be really, really good allies, they're going to have to extend this Black History Month into other months. So now the York Board decided, or at least at this school, I don't know, this is just a parent at the school who messaged me this email that she got, this group called Black, Excellent, Black Excellence 365 is going to come into their class for the whole month of uh, November once a week to teach them about anti-racism, anti-oppression, and all of this stuff. So not only is it taking away time from actually learning in class with their teacher, um, but it's infusing this toxic ideology into the minds of this grade, grade eight students. Yeah, great. I remember being 13. I never thought about someone else's race or what it meant. And... I had friends of all colors and of all backgrounds and you know exactly. can not just go back to that wasn't that a great time isn't that something worth striving towards a society that doesn't put these superficial traits first that's that is so true and you know it's once again painting every black student every black person with the same brush mm -hmm. it's it's just like uh, and and the other thing here, and this goes along with um, the whole gender ideology, is this whole aspect of victimhood. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, how can you be the best victim in our society? And not how you become a survivor, not how you thrive uh, through the difficulties of life, because we all have difficulties in life, no matter 
what they're caused by or how they're caused. And instead of teaching children to be overcomers and to be resilient, we keep pounding them over the head with, with this idea that, you know, you need to be a victim in order to be recognized. You have to be a victim of something or someone. And that and that's just so, so sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have, sorry, I have one last slide. Um, I quite like this picture. How, how inventive it was. I love it. It's beautiful. <laughs> but, but. I have to zoom in. There was some pretty, uh, I, I don't remember what was written, but I think it was on that right, right side. There's some posters there where it's, I don't know if it's possible to zoom in there. Okay. So show up in an authentic way own your privilege so white kids have to recognize their privilege and accept this label accept feedback so basically don't trust your own intuition and your own um, judgment you have to always be open to learning and to being told that you used the wrong language you had the wrong opinion because uh, there's only one way to think about these issues become a confidant whatever that means Bring diversity to the table. See something, say something. So this is this whole, you have to be an activist forever and always thing. You have to report your teachers who do something wrong, report your peers. Wow. You, they don't, schools often have anonymous systems now for reporting events at school, racist events. So that could be telling someone, hey, I like your hair. That's apparently racist now because you can't comment a black person's hair. Um, uh oh, so I already did this because I really liked this picture of this woman. Uh -huh. You're going to be canceled. <laughs> oh, hey, can I ask you something about this? How can a white child be authentic? And, you know, then to themselves, you know, be them their best self and then have to agree with everyone else. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. It's all a contradiction. It's like. They want to sell it as being authentic, but really what it is is just being a pushover person mm -hmm. who has no personality of their own and they become an ally. Like they, they always say, oh, ally is not a noun, it's a verb. It's something that you do on a daily basis and you have to be willing to keep doing it. It even says at the top here, as an ally, uh, you are there to be supportive, not to be the hero of the story. So stop trying to center your own ideas you have to accept what everyone else is telling you and just shut up commit to the continued time and effort it will take to become an, a better ally it's a perpetual there is no point at which these people will stop there's no okay we're gonna do this for a year we're gonna see how it is and then if everything if if we see a, a positive change then we can go back to normal society uh-uh this is not how a cultural revolution works. It's a perpetual striving towards a, a kind of utopia, which will never be attained and can't even be described. The whole, the whole premise of it is that you can never stop striving towards it. That's all. So, um, well, and uh, you know what, that's kind of where I was going is, uh, you know, kind of, as we finish up here, I was going to ask you, where does this all end? And I think you're describing it. It doesn't sound very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it can never, it can never end because they just keep problematizing more things and it just gets crazier and crazier and harder also to speak against it. Like, had we known where this was going to go 10 years ago, probably a lot of people would have spoken up, but I think everyone kind of justified it because they thought, oh, well, it's just a little thing. It's just, it's just one little word that they want said differently. It's just one activity they want. Uh, done differently um, and then it just kept going kept going pushing the limits now we have programs that are only for white uh, for, for black students um, like we're actively I would call them that segregation yes. when you're saying an event and if you're white you can't come um, now we're doing this and teachers are in this position where they're like holy moly how did we get here um, yeah. I we're bad. Well, that's, just, it, 
to the whole like, thing. Diversity is about, is really about separating, isn't it? One from yeah. another. If we went back 20 years to like the year, uh, I don't know, 2000, and in a school we said, hey, we're going to do an event next week and it's going to be only for black kids. I, I guarantee all the teachers would say, are you crazy? That's not how we operate in the society. We don't do that. We That's all right. races are the same. But now you have teachers who just see this happen and they just, they can't speak because they've, for years and years, they have held back. And honestly, I don't think that they really, um, <laughs> courage is a habit. Where is that from? There is an organization called Courage is a Habit. And I really believe that to be true. If you just silence yourself over years and years, you start to lose even your ability to to find the courage inside you. You you, you lose touch with it. You lose part of who you are. You lose self-respect. And then if you don't have any self-respect, how are you going to stand up for yourself? You don't even respect yourself. So that's I think that's where we're at. And we're at a place where a lot of educators are not only – um, feeling cowardly and not respecting themselves, but they're also um, demoralized. Yep. And every day at work is really tough. And they're surrounded by they can't they can't speak their mind, and they they want to leave teaching, but they have no plan B, and they can't talk about it with anyone. I talked to someone recently, and a teacher in Alberta, who uh, we chatted on the phone for like a half hour. And the next day she said to me by email, she said, um, thank you so much for chatting with me. I feel like I can breathe again. Yes. And that is the point. Like, imagine you just were able to talk about your yep. situation for a half hour and that's how grateful you feel. Um, it's just really sad. Well, I just, uh, when you were talking about courage, I was reminded about Dietrich Bonhoeffer at the end of... Um, the Second World War, who was imprisoned because he chose to stand um, and speak truth and try to awaken. Well, he was trying to awaken the Christian church at that time. There were 12,000 Christian pastors in Germany, and um, only 3,000 chose to speak out against what Hitler was doing to the Jews and uh, to annihilating Christians as well. It wasn't just the Jews, but it was special groups. It was all about special groups, really, when you get right down to it. And his quote, uh, and I didn't want to misspeak it, so here it is. Silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. And he was um, subsequently martyred. He was uh, murdered uh, by the Germans in the prison. And, you know, there's a cost to be paid for speaking out. And I think that we have become such a complacent society and so used to our own comfort that we hesitate to speak truth, especially in the marketplace, even amongst our friends. Uh, and I notice this regularly, that people are uh, afraid to even address these subjects with their family, with their friends, because as soon as you do, you're labeled as something. And yet, if we do not speak now, if we do not speak now, our children will be silenced. We will lose generations. In fact, we've probably lost in some ways two generations to this whole ideology. And so, I really thank you, Chanel, because what you said is so important. And courage, courage uh, is something that grows, I believe, as you feed it, you know. Um, and as you spend time with other courageous people who are willing to take on the establishment like you've been doing. You know, I have a, a motto that says, stand firm, walk cautiously, and live courageously. And I think, you know, every day I, I try and think about that. Like, I don't want to take two steps back. I want to stand firm in what I believe. I want to walk cautiously because I don't, 
I'm not purposely trying to offend anyone, but I won't back away. And we must live courageously in these times. And I thank you, Chanel, because that's what you're doing. You're living courageously. And I thank you so much for speaking up and speaking out on behalf of our children. Thanks for joining me. Any final things you'd like to say? Well, I just want to say thank you to you as well for all you do. You are a just so productive when it comes to this. I see the books you write and the videos you do and everything. You're not unstoppable. So thank you for that. And to all the other people standing up because I am certainly not alone. And there's a really great crowd of people who are, um, who are speaking up and hopefully changing a lot of minds in the process and inspiring others to do, to do so as well. So Absolutely. And we're bringing others with us, right? That's inspiring others because that's really what it's going to take is an army of others to come alongside to change uh, the culture and, and take it not back to archaic times, but to remove the evil influences. Thank you again for joining me. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for Critical Race Theory this week. What a deep dive kind of into understanding what your children are being taught consistently in the public schools and how our children's minds are being um, governed by an ideology that seeks not just to, not, not to actually bring people together, but actually to divide. So I hope that you'll rewatch this again because I think it's worth rewatching and that you as parents will consider what your next steps are. And I really appreciate Chanel coming on today. Please visit her, her Twitter account. Also visit my website, restoringthemosaic.ca, where you'll find my books and lots of other information. You can sign up for my newsletter. And I would appreciate if you thought of donating to what we're doing here, that would be a wonderful thing too. Thanks a lot. We'll see you soon. You've been listening to Truth Talks with Dr. Rand. Thank you so much for joining us today. You can find Anne's books, blog, and sign up for the newsletter by going to restoringthemosaic.ca.